Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plot Lines. I'm your host, Connor, and today we're going to talk about the ins and outs of Advent. I have with me uh, Matthew Pleasy, who is the president of catechismclass.com. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's, uh, we uh, first met uh, at uh, the Coalition for Canceled Priests conference. Mm-hmm. That was a lot of fun. Uh, how are you doing since? I've been doing good, been staying busy with a lot of different things. You know, obviously, I, in addition to running catechismclass.com, I write for a bunch of places like the Fatima Center and One Peter Five and uh, Catholic Family News. So all that's still going well. Uh, thankfully, I'm going to have another book coming out, too. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know, God willing, by Gaudete Sunday. Awesome. Uh, and it's going to be a compilation of all of my Catholic custom articles that I've written for the past several years for One Peter Five into a new book. And uh, we have some great people who have already reviewed the advanced copy, like Dr. Peter Kwasniewski and a few others who have offered their endorsements, too. So just a matter of getting it all finalized and available. But I'm hoping to close the book on that project. Awesome. Does it have a name or anything yet? Uh, Yes. So the book does have a working title. The working title is Restoring the Lost Customs of Christendom. Um, Still a working title. Probably will be publishing it under that title. But if anybody's interested, it's going to be published by Our Lady of Victory Press. So uh, Timothy Flanders of uh, Meaning of Catholic. So if you go to meaningofcatholic.com backslash shop, he has some of my current books available for purchase on there as PDF, my Roman Catechism Explained for the Modern World, as well as my different guides to fasting and abstinence. Uh, those, those are on there as PDF, and this, as soon as it's ready, uh, by Gaudete Sunday is the goal, is going to be published there as well. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that, that's awesome. So let's uh, let's get into Advent. What, like, what is Advent for people who really may not know, who might stumble upon this and just are curious? Mm-hmm. So Advent is a period of time for preparation uh, before we celebrate Christmas in the most general sense of the term. But Advent is going to be a bit more than that. It's a very ancient liturgical season that the church has instituted for our preparation, uh, not only for Christmas, but in order to adequately uh, contemplate our Lord's second coming and, and our own judgment as well. So there's many different facets to Advent, but it above all is a penitential season, a season of preparation. Um, You know, in some sense, it's going to be like Lent, which people probably have a much better understanding of. And in some senses, it's going to be quite different as well. But it is an ancient season. It really goes back centuries, Um, really took the, you know, shape around the fourth century. So it's certainly not a modern thing, not a medieval invention. It's very much something practiced by the ancient church, by, um, you know, probably the 10th century, it kind of took the form we know of it uh, taking today uh, as four different, you know, Sundays of preparation leading up to Christmas. So that's the length of time. But it should be noted that it used to be kept longer. Uh, In some places, it was kept as 40 days of fasting and preparation. And you'll still see that if you go to Milan, uh, and they keep the Ambrosian right there, which is going to be different than our Roman, right? Advent to them last six Sundays as well. So um, if somebody's talking about Advent, we generally are referring to approximately a month, four Sundays, but there are still people who keep a much longer Advent too, like the people who celebrate the Ambrosian Rite in Milan. Why did it lessen? Well, it's just, um, well, for instance, uh, it was very much modeled and fashioned after Lent, really, because they wanted 40 different days of of fasting and preparation. And I've talked about that before, how November 11th was really a Catholic Thanksgiving day for a long period of time, because it was a celebration of St. Martin of Tours. He was the first non-martyr, uh, really venerated as a saint. It was a great day to celebrate as the, the harvest was brought in the next day, November 12th, you would start this period of preparation, which would be 40 different uh, weekdays, uh, not including Sundays as fasting leading up to Christmas. So it was modeled after Lent. But as I talk about in my book, The Definitive Guide to Catholic Fasting and Absence, and as I often talk about, there's just been a gradual, continual, really since the Middle Ages, weakening of discipline. And that just was one of those things, too, where uh, fasting was really dropped. It was kept only by monks. You know, the Pope tried to revive it in the 1300s and said he wanted members of the papal court to keep it, but that kind of went away. So it really fell away as a season of fasting and such. And then it was, you know, reduced to four Sundays as well, uh, liturgically. Um, It is interesting to note that some places 
even in America, did keep some vestige of that. So um, Wednesdays and Fridays used to be days of mandatory fasting, even in America, for American Catholics during Advent, until uh, about the mid, uh, mid uh, or so 1800s. So when you start to see that kind of falling away, but it's not just an ancient thing. We're talking about there were days of fasting kept in Advent until relatively uh, recent times. And of course, anybody who goes to traditional mass should be familiar with Ember Days, how those are days kept as uh, fasting and absence, how they're Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. So that, of course, is still kept during the Advent season. Uh, but yeah, the notion of it being a period elongated of fasting kind of fell away. And, and with that, you know, shortly afterwards, we get the change in liturgical uh, celebration as well, which has lasted about a thousand years as only four Sundays. Where do Ember Days come from? Well, Ember Days, um, I wrote a, an article this year for Latin Mass Magazine and I and uh, Catholic Family News on that. But Ember Days, you know, the quanta tempora of Latin are the, you know, four periods throughout the year that uh, we keep as to thank God for the harvest, uh, for, you know, things brought in from the fields. We pray as well for ordinations, especially. In fact, even the 1917 Code of Canon Law said generally priestly ordination should be reserved only for Ember Saturdays. Uh, mm -hmm. And Episcopal consecration should take place on the Feast of the Apostles. So the different apostles they throughout the year. So that's, you know, even a vestige relatively recent of that. But they really go back to the Old Testament. The Ember Days are, are really uh, modeled after some Old Testament fasts, which took place every season. And the church Christianized that practice and adopted those and continued those. So Ember Days are extremely ancient, just like Advent being a very ancient time period as well. Um, uh, Ember Days are, you know, days, like I said, of fasting and absence. They should be increased prayer times as well. And they occur... Um, you know, four different times a year, three times at each, uh, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Of course, Fridays, because that's the day our Lord died, Wednesdays, since he was betrayed, and Saturdays as well, since that was a day kept uh, in Rome as a day of fasting and penance, unlike other places for uh, uh, an ancient period of time uh, as well, because our Lord lay in the tomb on Saturday. So that's the symbolic reason for Saturdays. Gotcha. Okay, so this, uh, so Advent has sort of, become lessened as uh sort of um but really it's still there it's still uh four weeks before right. christmas and uh you know we have we have fasting that is you know should be modeled off of uh lent what does that what does the fasting look like yep. comparatively but I will say that even if, you know, the church doesn't and has not mandated mandated mm -hmm. Advent fasting for a long time, that doesn't mean it's not something we should do or something that's not encouraged. The church has often said, uh, you know, to go beyond the minimum. That's what St. Francis of Sales famously said, that if you could fast more than the church requires, perhaps you should. And now with the church requiring so little compared to what it was at the time that he wrote that, you know, all the more for us to try to voluntarily keep some of these extra days. For instance, you might want to ease into, um, instead of going full in fasting all weekdays other than Sundays, you might want to do what uh, St. Charles Borromeo said uh, when he took over and he tried to revive the Advent fast, St. Martin's Lent in the Ambrosian Rite in his diocese. He mandated Wednesdays, uh, Fridays, and Mondays as days of fasting and absence in, in his own uh, area. So that's something you might want to do too, is this Advent Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, keep that as a day of absence and fasting. Of course, absence all Fridays of the year anyway, but add this on as well. Uh, you might also, if you're not uh, uh, familiar with the Ember Days, note those, put those on your calendar, plan to you know, fast in those. But other days, too, that come up, uh, you should um, keep that in mind because uh, as you look at the priest during the Advent Masses, um, he's wearing violet. You know, these are all days of penance, really, unless it's a feast day, so... Uh, but even if it's a feast day, if it's St. Nicholas Day, it doesn't mean we couldn't fast on that day. There's no uh, reason that we can't fast on a certain day. So there seems to be a false dichotomy in the church now that if it's a if saint is commemorated that day, you you can't fast. That's simply unheard of. Uh, in fact, um, December 8th this year, obviously, is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, a holy day of obligation. Uh, it falls on a Friday. Uh, and one thing I talked about in an article on the A Catholic Life blog is how 
Pope St. Pius X famously really liberalized fasting and absence practices. Most people don't realize that because beforehand, because it fell on a Friday, it would still be a required day of abstinence uh, without papal dispensation, even though it's a holy day of obligation. And he changed that with the 1917 Code of Canon Law that he and his successor ultimately implemented, which says that if it's a holy day of obligation in your area, you do not have to keep the absence. So it is automatically... Um, remove for you. Of course, if a place a person is listening and the Immaculate Conception is not a holy day in their area, that would not apply. It depends on your area. So there was some controversy on that as well. But uh, beforehand, if December 8th fell on a Friday, it was still a day of mandatory absence without papal dispensation. So the notion of even if it's a holy day of obligation, there's some sort of um, obligation that one must not abstain is simply false. So this whole season, if my point is, is a period of penance, even with the Holy Day of Obligation, even with Our Lady of Guadalupe's feast day, even with St. Nicholas Day, even with all these people throwing Christmas parties so much earlier and, and all these you know festivities, it's still a time of penance. So we should always think, what can we do to keep this as a time uh, of penance to ease into that? And of course, when we're talking about uh, fasting and absence, some definitions, like you asked a minute ago, absence refers to this time of year to not eating flesh meat of animals or birds. Um, so, you know, obviously things like pork or beef or chicken or turkey, things like that it doesn't include fish and it doesn't include animal products, uh, you know, at this time. And it has not during Advent for a very long time. So eggs are okay. Fish are okay. You know, milk is okay, etc. Fasting refers to eating only once a day. Uh, your standard meal once a day. In the early church, that was always done after sunset. The time moved around a bit, but basically it's one meal a day towards the evening. You can have a smaller item in the morning if you need to, you know, to sustain yourself, and you can have a second snack as well. The smaller one's called the frustulum, the larger one's called the collation. The modern church has adopted, I think, some um, unfortunate terminology that Fasting days are days of one meal and two small meals that don't equal it. Well, it's it's not a meal then. It's really just a snack. So, mm -hmm. uh, But the technical terms would be frustulum and collation. But that's what fasting means. You're really eating one meal a day. And you can have up to two of these other snacks that don't equal your meal at different times as well. But you should also keep them as days of abstinence. So uh, obviously, Ember Days, those Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Uh, apply, I would encourage as well, at least all Wednesdays and all Fridays of Advent too, in addition to December 7th, the Vigil of the Immaculate Conception. That should also be kept as a day of fasting and absence as a minimum. So that's going to be on a Thursday this year. But in 1957, Pope Pius XII made that a mandatory day of fasting and absence for the Universal Church when he moved it from August 14th to, the, to that day. That change happened in July 1957. So rather recent thing. We should definitely, to, in order to adequately celebrate the Immaculate Conception, I think, keep December 7th, of course, as a day of fasting and absence. So if anybody is listening, I would literally get out your calendar, start writing this down, you know, December 7th, fasting and absence, obviously all Fridays, absence, but I would add fasting to those, add fasting to the Wednesdays, put the Ember Days on there. Christmas Eve is a fasting day as well. Most people don't realize that in a day of absence. So put all those in now and then see beyond that, what extra can you do? Because we're really offering all of this to our Lord as, you know, sort of a spiritual bouquet. Uh, for for his birth. So think about that in that mindset of getting our Lord something for Christmas by offering this penance uh, for the good of souls and for sinners and for conversions, etc. Yeah, that's great. I, I mean, I love just going heavy into Advent uh, with uh, offering up, with making Advent truly penitential because it really has become just like kind of it, a lot of places it's just become basically nothing except for you know an advent wreath that, yeah. that's basically the symbolism and uh you know you kind of ruin what the church is trying to tell you through sort of the liturgical colors mm -hmm. you're you're uh you're i mean the uh the priest is wearing violet uh majority of the time in advent and if you're not sort of taking in what that means, which it mm -hmm. means it's a penitential, uh, which, you know, you wouldn't really understand that. I, I don't think, uh, you know, growing up, I don't think I really understood that 
uh, Violet meant penitential because you have Advent and you have Lent. Of course, Lent, you understand, is penitential, but then comparatively, Ad, Advent is the complete opposite by practice. Right, right. And, uh, and of course, there's other Violet days throughout the year which have been really reduced, uh, you know, in relatively recent times. In fact, most of the vigils throughout the year were eliminated in the 1950s, so they're not even in the 1962 Missal. For instance, uh, you know, November... Um, you know, 29th, that's, that's the vigil of St. Andrew traditionally removed in, uh, you know, the changes before, um, by Pius the 12th, but beforehand it would have been a violent day. So you would have associated that as a, as a day of penance and, uh, all of the apostles feast days used to be holy days of obligation on the universal calendar. They weren't kept, uh, in most localities, but, uh, universally they were, and they almost all of them, except, you know, ones, for instance, falling during the Christmas season, like St. John or St. Philip and James during the Easter tide, they all had a vigil in front of it. Uh, and the vigil was a penitential day. But when you drop those and you drop Halloween being a, a you know, a mandatory uh, vigil day of fasting and abstinence, and, you know, you, you drop, um, in fact, even Rome kept uh, the day before the purification, the vigil of the purification, up until the late 1800s as a fasting day. Even though it wasn't liturgically kept as the vigil of the purification, it was still the feast day of St. Ignatius, uh, you know, not St. Ignatius Loyola, but St. Ignatius the Martyr. Uh, but even that, as the day before, the upcoming vigil was still kept as a as a fasting day. And, and that's kind of what we see even with... Uh, Pope Pius XII making in 1957, December 7th, a day of fasting and absence, even though basically two years beforehand, he removed the liturgical vigil associated with December 7th. So there's no vigil there, <laughs> just the feast of St. Ambrose now. But then a few days, few years later, he's like, yeah, that'll be a day of preparation for the next day. So that would be a required day of fasting and absence. So it's actually a, a kind of a strange thing he did. A lot of people still wonder why he would remove the vigil and then a few years later make that day a, a fasting day um so it's it just kind of a weird historical thing that i've never quite understood why um but you know as you get more into it you realize Advent does need to be a distinct season it's not christmas it is not christmas anticipated it's not the time to listen to christmas music not the time to have christmas parties not time to exchange gifts uh it is a period of preparation it is it should be and just like when we actually begin christmas on december 25th we should be celebrating that throughout january you know, I can't tell you the amount of people who, tell, who I've met over the years who think the 12 days of Christmas are the 12 days leading up to Christmas. No, they begin <laughs> December 25th. They go until the uh, January you know, 6th and the Epiphany, but Epiphany traditionally had his own octave until Pius XII removed that. So then, you you know, you go really to January 13th, but the season itself is 40 days. That's why the Feast of the Purification on February 2nd was a big deal. Um, this particular year, though, I would encourage people uh, you know, of course, put up your tree around Christmas, not now, not earlier, um, but probably take it down before February 2nd, because Septuagesima starts a little early this year, uh, mm. right at the end of January. So as we enter that period of really serious preparation before Lent, uh, I think it would be a good thing for everybody to take down the decoration a little bit earlier uh, this year in January. But that still being said, December 25th starts Christmas. That's not the end of Christmas. That's the beginning. Even Christmas Eve is still part of Advent because if you're going to midnight mass, that's actually December 25th at midnight. Mm -hmm. You know, traditionally Christmas Eve has own mass you go to in the morning and it's all in violet and it's a day of fasting. And it's, uh, the, uh, you know, the Italians have that wonderful custom of the Feast of Seven Fishes that night where they have seven different kinds of fish or seafood in honor of the seven sacraments. Or for larger families, you might have 12 different kinds. And they would say it was for the apostles. For smaller families, you might use three or five, uh, you know, all symbolic, of course, to the faith. But just a way to live out uh, in, in your families um, a day of, you know, the end of the fast. And there's much more that could be said later on the Christmas Eve fast if you want to get into that. Yeah, but first, where do you where would you lay the decline of Advent in the culture? Would you put it towards commercialization? Is it more the fault of Protestantism, or is it the fault of uh, the church not prom not promoting it, not not really celebrating, or not not celebrating, but not the uh, fault, not um, mandating practices? Yeah, I think part of the reason it fell away was certainly the the loss of those penitential practices like fasting during Advent in the 1800s. I think that's a key part of it. Uh, I do think commercialization, though, is is certainly a very key to blame here. 
uh, because we have so much people with anticipation uh, and then stores catering to that and then playing Christmas music, you know, at said stores and everybody feels they have to rush, you know, things in order to get your money because then you're going to run out of money and you can't buy gifts. So we need to celebrate Christmas basically now. I think that certainly fueled it to a serious extent. But of course, if we had the church even stronger mandating, like back in the time of St. Martin's Lent, these were all days of fasting and abstinence, that would also go, you know, serious um, to help us as well. Because if we look during Lent, we don't really feel Easter is really anticipated by the culture much. Of course, it's not as much of a gift giving holiday. So that, you know, certainly a part of it, you don't have that commercialization. But of course, you see Easter candy at stores plenty early during Lent. But I've never heard people like, I just can't resist. I have to buy it all now and eat it. So it, it's almost like the commercialization is there. But at the same hand, the church not mandating certain practices of fasting and abstinence uh, also kind of goes hand in hand. They help fuel each other, I think, to contribute to the decline that we've seen. That's a great point about Lent. I, I, you know, there is a commercialization element of 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 Easter, but it really doesn't. Uh, I don't think it affects Catholics very much when uh, when you have the commercialization. I think uh, Lent is still Lent, and you know, nobody's nobody's advocating for moving Easter up. I guess right. while right. there's a constant moving up of. Christmas celebrations, yes. and even to the point where it's that where the day after Thanksgiving has basically become, uh, you know, part of this weird Christmas season. That uh, oh, I know. That is just even if you watch the parades on TV, you got Santa coming in on the Thanksgiving Day parades, you know, and it's yeah. like, but it, but it's Thanksgiving. What hap what happened to Thanksgiving as it as its own, you know. Holiday, even the closest parish to where I live, uh, where I don't go, but the closest one to my house has been advertising around town with flyers, at least in the neighborhood. And it's advertising their Christmas party, which is coming up on December 3rd. And I will be writing them because I think um, I told them, I, you know, it's not very appropriate to have an Advent party. And certainly you have mislabeled the party. It's certainly not Christmas yet. So this is also the church not, you know, drawing the line and saying, no, it's not Christmas yet. You know, people might want to write memes, say things on Twitter, post things on Facebook about this being different. But when even parishes in the area just given like, oh, we'll just call all these Christmas parties and we'll celebrate it now. Like, you know, you, you've lost the fight that way. So, I mean, parishes and priests may be like, no, there's no Christmas celebrations happening yet. Christmas has not started. In fact, their party is going to be when Advent starting, you know, the first Sunday of Advent, <laughs> not even waiting to go that day Sunday. You know, it's quite absurd. Well, I think you'll find this even more absurd. There, uh, a Holy Name Society chapter is having a Christmas party this week, and it's not even Advent. Oh, wow. That's that's pretty See, low. That, that's, that's the modern secular world, you know, totally, you know, eradicating Advent. You know, even, I mean, Advent hasn't even started yet. Well, know? that's actually the church. Uh, or, you know, this sort of element of the church. That's true, but modern society infecting that because sure. you see all these Christmas promotions and ads and everything. It's like they've given up. Yeah, exactly. It's it it's it's a defeatist strategy. It's, you know, you've already accepted defeat. Oh, why? You know, just but that we're not called to be defeatist. We're not called to accept defeat I right. mean, because Christ has already won. So mm -hmm. there's no point in uh, letting the culture uh, defeat us, you know. Right, and I feel so many people just give in to what the culture is doing, or like I just it's not worth the fight, or you know, and just people don't care perhaps what it is. But uh, and some people say, oh, it's not that important. Let's let's not talk about. It. There's more important things to talk to. But of course, you know, our Lord, you know, said that he who you know, teaches others to do, you know, break the least commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, you know? So he's not saying just focus on the most important things and everything else don't worry about. And the church has always legislated, you know, serious large matters and small matters, you know, from very serious sins to minute details in the liturgy. So it, it's simply, I think, a false dichotomy to also say, like, it's not that important of an issue. And we have actual serious, very serious things affecting the church and the world and society and souls going to hell so much. Like, let's not worry about this. I think that that would be skipping over an important part of rediscovering our Catholic culture uh, and those customs associated with Advent. And, and of course, even though Advent's penitential, that, that doesn't mean there can't be some joy to it. You know, Gaudete Sunday is a is a period of joy. You know, St. Nicholas Day is a wonderful day too. And 
with the custom of putting out your shoes the night before and children, you know, get their shoes filled with candy or other things. So that that's a wonderful custom. I encourage people to do. I've seen done. And I think that, you know, adds some a nice joy to the, the this period of time. Even St. Lucy's Day coming up on December 13th. Um, you know, a lot of people of Swedish and uh, Italian descent have a particular reason to celebrate that day. But there's a lot of different food customs associated with that day. There might be processions, even in Chicago, the Swedish neighborhood, even though it's not Catholic, we'll do a uh, procession. I think the Lutheran church does of women really? and girls dressed up and they wear candles and they're processing outside because of St. Lucy's uh, connection with, with women finding, um, you know, a husband. So, but you know, um, there's also those saffron buns, which are known as St. Lucy's cakes. They're shaped into X's or figure eights or S shapes or crowns. So some societies, you know, do that too, especially in Sweden. So that doesn't mean that you can't celebrate these things during Advent. So um, there's certainly elements of of joy and longing and looking forward to that um, uh, can be done. And, you know, like Christmas baking, I talk about that in my article on Advent customs, doesn't mean you can't start your baking, you know, before December 25th, you know, you can start the days leading up and that brings about the anticipation, you know, for Christmas. So there's ways of celebrating, you know, joyfully during Advent, but at the same time, understanding Advent is not Christmas. It is a period of longing and preparation. That's why there's a wonderful custom, you know, tradition in some places to read the entire book of Isaiah during Advent, or, mm. or at least parts of it, since Isaiah talks so much about the promise of the Redeemer. And obviously our Lord is the Redeemer uh, that that he talked about. So reading through that would be a wonderful way to, uh, you know, also prepare during this time. Um, same thing with the Rorate Mass. You know, that's that's the, the votive mass set of Our Lady said illuminated by candlelight, you know, very early in the morning. You might find parishes do it a couple times during Advent, even though they can do it more often. That would be celebrated in white vestments, so not Advent, hmm. uh, not the Advent Violet. Uh, but but it's still a wonderful way to, you know, think about Our Lady conceiving and giving, you know, uh, birth to Our Lord ultimately. Uh, on Christmas, but uh, that's a wonderful tradition. If you've never been, if people have listening never been to Rorate Mass, I would try to find one. I know there's some, you know, in the area here uh, in Chicago this upcoming Advent, but hopefully you find it more often. Uh, and it's a beautiful custom too. So all that being said, yes, penitential season, society is and the church have kind of given up the fight, uh, but we need to make it penitential. And if the church isn't going to legislate, you have to do these fast, we should do it voluntarily. But at the same time, we can joyfully look forward to various things during Advent. There's no dichotomy, you know, preventing the both of them from being the case. Yeah, last year I was able to go to my first Durate Mass, and it was absolutely beautiful. Um, it, it was great because especially it was put on by, like, one of the one of the local parishes. It wasn't, you know, it, uh, it was just put on by a priest who knows the Latin Mass and uh, had been doing, like, a few uh, a few Latin masses uh, periodically uh, because of either the feast of the saint that the church was uh, named after, or you know I think that he did a, a requiem uh, mass for All Souls Day, mm -hmm. and then he did a Rorate mass, which absolutely beautiful. I mean, just the way just the way you start in the dark. Mm -hmm. and, uh like in the middle of the dark with just candles yeah. is so amazing and in the morning it, you know it's it reminds me a little bit of how uh easter or mm -hmm. sorry uh the uh easter vigil was originally yeah. celebrated uh starting in the dark in the morning which is very interesting as well but anyways mm -hmm. it, it is a great uh part of advent that really is not available very many places right so yeah so if you can i would look up latin mass parishes near you and if you find one advertised you might notice like wow why is it at 5 a.m or like is that a misprint like no it, it's going <laughs> to no. be very early uh but that's symbolic you know because it's going to be it's you know traditionally filled only with candlelight so as the morning comes on the sun rises you'll see the sun illuminating the church so there's that beautiful symbolism of christ you know resurrection and the 
and the coming of the Savior. But it also reminds us for a very long time, Mass was only allowed to be said in the morning, you know, r- you know, roughly around uh, sunrise to basically noon, because that connection of the rising sun and Christ's resurrection was so important. There was no evening Masses really allowed until after World War II. Um, that's why I'm not a fan of evening Masses uh, anywhere, really. Um, and plus, it makes keeping the traditional Eucharistic fast really impossible. Um, so, I mean, because the traditional Eucharistic fast was no food or no water from midnight on. So mm. um, people say that's one of the reasons they started allowing, um, uh, when they allowed evening masses, they changed the Eucharistic fast. And I go over in my book, The Definitive Guide to Catholic Fasting and Absence, all about the Eucharistic fast, because that changed a lot too. Uh, unfortunately, all recently too, for you know, well over a thousand years, it was kept as the same. So we see that weakening practice too. But, you know, finding... Uh, the time to go to a very early morning mass like that is is uh, something that everybody should do at least once, you know, in their life. Indeed, very beautiful. So you mentioned Saint Nicholas. How do you think, like the myths of Saint Nicholas, you know, the myths of Santa Claus, kind of thing? How do you think that can fit? I mean, this is kind of also a Christmas thing too, but like, mm-hmm. how do you think it can fit into a Catholic celebration? Should it be just gotten rid of like uh at least uh the myths not the not the actual stories uh, of saint nicholas himself but do you think it should be gotten rid of should it stay how should it work you know i think a lot of these times when you have real saint stories impacting something uh and then it you know it's okay if some myths and, and legends arise too like i was recently talking about that regarding saint barbara you know she was removed from the 1969 uh, calendar of the novus ordo because some people said that um, some of the legends associated with her life might be might not be true and they might not be historic so although she's a saint and she really existed you know we don't want to um you know give too much credence to, to these legends so let's just drop her from the calendar even though she was such an influential saint as the patroness, you know, of artillery men and, and yeah. armorers, especially. Uh, in fact, when I was in Puerto Rico a couple of years ago, the famous fort there even had a whole chapel on the fort to St. Barbara. And that's where the wow. that's where all the canoners and everybody else would hear mass uh, often before they would venture out and some of them would die, of course, in battle. But that was the chapel and it was dedicated to her. So simply saying there might be some legends mixed into some of these stories. We should just, you know kind of drop all these celebrations because we're not exactly sure what's right and what's not, uh, I think would be false. That would be like our Lord said, you know, we don't uh, pull out things because you might tear the wheat with the tares, you know. So sometimes these things grow. And, of course, we know St. Nicholas, of course, was a real saint, uh, you know, bishop in really modern-day Turkey from the 4th century, uh, you know, great charity. Some people, you know, talk about that famous incident. He had the Council of Nicaea where he punched, you know, Arian in the face. Some people say that's not actually real. Uh, but again, that's like one of those things, okay, it's a legend, you know, punching, punching in the face, did he or did he not really doesn't matter, uh, because he was a, um, a serious vocal opponent of Arianism. So whether or not he physically struck him or he struck his, you know, false teachings verbally and in writing, the message is still the same. Same thing with, you know, Santa Claus really taking over for, uh, St. Nicholas, as long as we bring back that connection to St. Nicholas day, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Because especially when we're focusing on the charity he had, of course, where he would throw coins through windows to have a man pay for his, uh, you know, daughter's dowries. And that's where the customs associated with putting your shoes out and they would be filled. Um, I think that's great, too. And especially whenever we talk about these saints to connect uh, with them and help them you know, us see how do they impact our lives. You know, the charity of of St. Nicholas will be a wonderful day for us to think about what kind of charity we can do to others leading up to Christmas, you know, or what charity can we do for the faith and our Lord and spreading awareness of the real meaning of Advent as a distinct liturgical season. So there's a lot that can be said. I think living liturgically is very important, uh, but that's not just, of course, reading the mass text for the day. It's also living out those Catholic customs. And St. Nicholas has been, you know, invoked for such a long time. In fact, he is the patron saint of the fellowship I run with 1 Peter 5 the fellowship of St. Nicholas to promote the return to traditional fasting. And some people are a little surprised because they think, oh, St. Nicholas is only really known for those acts of charity, uh, which is, I mean, that is what he's famously known for, but that that really shows you saints are not, you know, one dimensional. They're multifaceted. 
And one thing I really liked when I read the account in the traditional Matins reading for St. Nicholas was it said that from his very infancy, infancy, he abstained on Wednesdays and Fridays. So even when he was nursing as an infant, he abstained those days. And that's one of the reasons I felt called to make him the patron, because he shows us that we can have great charity and great fasting. It's not like you fast and abstain more. You have to be grumpy. You have to have a negative outlook on everything. No, there's you can be, have both. You can have great charity for others and, and being very penitential yourself. I see that as well in St. Patrick, one of my favorite saints. Obviously, he did so much to spread the faith in Ireland. Of course, not Irish you know, himself, but did much uh, to save the entire country. Uh, we don't throw him out just because of the snakes legends, which probably isn't true. Uh, but but the stories of his life are, are really remarkable. And something you don't hear about in those traditional matins readings is at night he would pray all 150 psalms. And some of them he would pray kneeling in the water as additional wow. penance. So saints can be known for great works of charity and others. But behind the scenes, there's always great penance animating their lives because they're doing it not just for themselves, but for those they serve too. Beautiful, beautiful. So uh, can you explain the Advent wreath? Yeah, so the Advent wreath is probably, uh, you know, not the Christmas tree, which is for Christmas, but the Advent wreath is probably the most distinctive symbol uh, of Advent. Uh, I mean, it, it should be. It, it really is. Um, it is German in origin. It's, as I said, probably the most recognized Advent custom. It's, you know, a wreath made of evergreens that's often but not necessarily bound by a circle of wire. And it symbolizes the many years from Adam to Christ in which the world awaited its Redeemer. And it also represents the years that we have awaited his final coming in glory. Because, of course, there's two different, uh, you know, uh, reasons we're looking to happen. One is to prepare for Christmas. And the other time, keeping in mind the coming of our Lord at the second coming. And the wreath is going to have four different candles in it. Three of them are going to be violet or purple. One's going to be uh, the pink one for Gaudete Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent, and in the middle, many people put a white candle as well to light on Christmas uh, as the period is over. So it's just a way to kind of visually see the drawing closer to the Christmas season. Um, you know, I really like the website of Fish Eaters. You know, when I found tradition years ago, nearly 20, you know, years ago, I went to the Fish Eaters website and all the liturgical customs and living liturgical year were uh, really influential on me. And they, for instance, have all the Advent rituals published there. So the day before Advent, there's a blessing of the wreath that, you know, father or the family can do. These aren't blessings that the priest has to do. And then uh, each Sunday, you know, there's different readings you can do, really the scripture readings from the Mass or some other ones they have them on there. And then a prayer of blessing, and there might be a hymn as well. But that's just a way to live liturgically. So the Advent wreath, some people are very opinionated about it, how it shouldn't be in the sanctuary, it shouldn't be in the church, it doesn't have an official liturgical uh, role. I don't get involved in that. I think it certainly can be uh, at a church, but it certainly can be at your home too. So I have one in my home, everybody, I think every Catholic family should have one. Um, it is not a time, you know, to light the tree yet, uh, but it is certainly time to get ready to light the Advent wreath. So if you don't have one, you should buy one soon. Um, and the candles, make sure the candles are ready. Get the candles blessed by a priest. You know, make sure the priest is using the traditional blessing of candles from the Roman ritual, uh, the traditional blessing of candles, much deeper and more meaningful than any modern one. So make sure they're blessed. Uh, he could even bless the wreath if he wanted to. But then each Sunday you can do these, you know, prayers, which are, you know, are a blessing anybody in the family can do along with the readings. Um, I think it's a nice tradition, though. Wonderful. Uh, uh, I would say last but not least, can you talk about the O antiphons? Yeah, so the O antiphons. So people, um, you know, this is something a lot of you know priests are mainly familiar with is the Divine Office. You know, the Church. You know, for instance, uh, prays throughout the day seven times. You know, throughout the day, these different prayers from the Divine Office. Nowadays, they call the liturgy the hours. You might also refer to it as the breviary, since the book it comes from is is the breviary. It's called. But um, these different prayers are said throughout the day. So some in the early morning, some throughout the day, you know, evening, you have a night one. They go by uh, names like Matins, Lauds, Tersec, Non, Vespers, Compline, Prime was in there as well. Um, so these different prayers are said by priests uh, and nuns primarily, monks as well. Uh, lay people 
are encouraged to pray them, uh, certainly can, usually don't. I find most lay people aren't very familiar with it. In fact, the work that I do at catechismclass.com, I make uh, praying some of the hours online a part of many lessons because I want people to experience that because this is not personal prayer. This is liturgy. Same as the mass is part of the church's official prayers, the divine office is part of the church's official prayer. So when you're joining in, you know, lauds in the morning, you are truly joining in the church, which is praying this as well. Uh, and it's okay if, you know, we're praying the traditional, uh, you know, bravery and it doesn't match it exactly. We're still uniting our same prayers. Um, as I wrote before for the Fatima Center, there's many different Catholic calendars. So if we keep the traditional one and others don't, that's fine because you have different uh, you know, calendars from the Dominican rite, the pre-Monsterian rite, the Carmelite rite, Eastern rites in the church keep all different calendars as well. So there's no one true calendar. Uh, so there might be some differences. But the point is, these prayers are said throughout the day, depending on one's rite uh, and, and the book used. And they're a way to sanctify time because all time is given to God. And it's a way to sanctify the day. Now, the O antiphons refer to Vespers, the evening prayers. So said, you know, traditionally right around the time the sun goes down. And these are the series of antiphons to the Magnificat, which kind of occurs around the end of Vespers, which are prayed as part of Vespers from December 17th to December 23rd inclusive. Uh, these are very ancient. They go back as far as the 400s. Uh, and each of the titles of the O antiphons addresses our Lord with a special title given to the Messiah and refer to a prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, they're also called the great antiphons too. Uh, and they all begin with an O. So that's, you know, why they're called the O antiphons. And um, you can, you know, listen, um, you know, I, in the article that you'll have in the show notes on the customs of Avon, there'll be a link uh, to, you can listen to hear some of them chant. As if, for instance, December 17th is O Sapientiae, or which means O Wisdom, you know, O Wisdom who comes from on high. Or December 18th, O Adonai. December 19th, O Radix Jesse, O Root of Jesse. So you got O Wisdom, O Adonai, O Root of Jesse, O Key of David, O Morning Star, O King of Nations, finally, O Emmanuel. And um, if you take these, um, if you were to start with the last title, and it takes the first letter of each of these. So for instance, Emmanuel, Rex, Oriens, Clavix, Radix, etc. The Latin word, Eo, Kreos is formed, if you take those letters and you form it, meaning tomorrow I will come. So there's also mm -hmm. another meaning if you take the letters, you wow. make that Latin word. So thus the O antiphons not only bring intensity to our Advent preparation, but they really bring it to a joyful conclusion as you're filling in really tomorrow I will come since they end on December 23rd in the evening. So the link though to listen to them prayed in Latin by, by some monks, I think is particularly beautiful. And even if you're not praying, you know, for instance, Vespers, you're not, you're not, you know, accustomed to do that. You don't know how, I know some people are a little turned off because they're like, oh, this is like a church's official liturgy and I don't know how to say it. That's fine too. At the very least, you can make it a point as part of your customs with your family or individually, December 17th through the 23rd, simply listening to them as part of your evening prayers, uh, these O antiphons. So um, that's at the very least what I would encourage people to do. But they're very beautiful and they're also very ancient. It goes to show you how the church has celebrated Advent for a very long time. And when people like Protestants, you know, try to reduce, you know, the church's seasons and say it doesn't really matter. In, in fact, you look even at the Puritans, you know, they outlawed Christmas. You know, there was <laughs> no Christmas. They outlawed liturgical celebrations. Advent started in the 400s. You know, obviously it is incredibly an ancient time. So it needs to be kept as its own distinct season. I'm glad you mentioned O antiphons because I do think that's a, a nice thing you can do. Really beautiful tradition. A lot of symbolic meaning too in that. Uh, indeed, all beautiful. Those uh, Puritans also outlawed Easter and Pentecost, and in some sense, they uh, they kind of won on Pentecost. Unfortunately, that's not a holiday people really celebrate very much anymore, uh, except for the church. So, um, but yeah, no, uh, there's a lot more in uh, your article on the customs of Advent. And I, uh, I'll have the link in the description. I suggest everybody read it and, you know, bring back the spirit of Advent, Advent bring back the customs, re restore Advent to its proper place, because right. then Christmas will be its proper celebration as well. 
make mm -hmm. sure restoring sure Christendom. You know, exactly. this, this will be the first chapter based on this article in the book that I'm coming out with. And it's okay. going to go over all the temporal seasons as well as many different sanctoral celebrations as well. Because obviously the church is the temporal seasons from Advent, uh, Septuagesima, Lent, time after Pentecost. You know, but I go over everything from the Sacred Heart to, you know, customs associated with, with, with Ember Days, different Saints Days, patronal feast days. There, there's a lot that can be said about the customs that our forefathers did and, and observed and part of the reason you know we talk about why is advent not you know celebrated as such is this weakening of, of customs and and we see that as well like you know if i've talked to you know other people about saint lucy celebration or saint nicholas they might not know about that and so many others um you know there was customs associated with saint clement's day i'm going to be talking about in the book and nobody knows the english custom of clementing where children would go around and they would pray, mm. you know, hit these loud things and, bla and blacksmith would have these tradition with this day as well, all, all in honor of, you know, one of the first popes. So uh, there's a lot, you know, I'm talking about in there, but I'm glad you bring it up because honoring the liturgical year, actually living it, not anticipating things too fast, but being in the moment, but longing for the future, I think is also very important. So that's kind of what, what this was about and what the whole book is going to be about too. Awesome. I'm excited for your book. That that sounds really great. Uh, and it sounds like a great addition to Guéranger and all that as well. Yes, I do quote from him in there. I quote from uh, Father Weezer in there. There's different good books on different Catholic customs. Uh, I know, you know, Dr. Foley writes good articles for the new liturgical movement on customs. So I kind of talk about all that. You know, one of the best books I found on Catholic customs is is out of print. So like if you look for it, you know, on Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, it might be, you know, hundreds of dollars. So this <laughs> is, you know, making available and applying to our own world now, at least same, you know, customs from the past, including things that have, you know, at that time were well observed, but things have been forgotten now, like, you know, the, the feast day of the, of the patron of the cathedral of your diocese or the, your own parish's feast day or the patron saint of your diocese, which might be very different than the patron saint of the cathedral, all honored in different ways. In addition to your own name day. Yeah, uh, that's what so, I was thinking too, name day. Yeah, those are all mentioned. So that is um, all things for us to keep in mind, to learn and live. And I feel like as people uh, get further and further into their life as, you know, a traditional Catholic, you know, at first you're like, wow, this is so different. And then you're, you're like, okay, I really understand this. I really understand this. But then you realize, oh, there's another layer I can go deeper. There's another layer I can go deeper. Um, there's so much that, you know, every year try to make your Advent and your Lent a little bit stricter, a little bit harder, a little bit more enriching. And um, I find that in that way, you can keep it uh, more and more relevant. And certainly if you're keeping this as a period of preparation, uh, as penance, as you should, I would encourage people to have a intention in mind. You know, I'm like, you know, I'm encouraging some people, for instance, to do all your fasting of seeing this Advent for the conversion of maybe a particular family member or something else, you know, leading up to Christmas. You want somebody else who's go to go to mass who hasn't in a while. Maybe you, you can offer a lot of these penance for that particular person or for your priest if he's under a lot of persecution right now for saying the traditional mass or for your diocese or for the conversion of the church's enemies. You know, it becomes more real when you're not just doing it to get over with, well, I want Christmas to be here, but realizing, you know, I want to do it for the good of others and for charity, like St. Nicholas would do, and understanding as well that Avon is about our own death and preparing for our judgment and the final judgment. So obviously we'll be judged on charity and charity defined and has always defined our Lord's, you know, followers. So if you have great charity for others, that should be very much seen by, by your deeds. So I would encourage everybody to keep that actively in mind and penance because you don't want to just take on a whole lot extra fasting if you're not also praying more or it won't be worth it indeed thank you matthew for sort of bringing us uh deeper layers of catholic culture and customs and into the liturg liturgical year and it's it's new year's on uh well new year's eve is on a saturday and, right. and uh the new year begins on sunday this Sunday, so uh, celebrate appropriately. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so thank you, uh, Matthew. Do you have anything to promote uh, other than the books? Uh, if anybody does want to learn more, uh, we have a special course on catechismclass.com on Advent. It will have a different lesson for each of the days in the first week of Advent. It has lessons for all the Sundays as well. 
as well as the Immaculate Conception, the Vigil of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, that's a, the, these are courses that combine scripture, tradition, various prayers um, using our seven-step format. So we're going to have a sale on this particular course for Advent on our website. So um, you can uh, sign up for that. Uh, going to catechismclass.com, all courses, scrolling down the liturgical year once you'll find the Advent one. But I think that that's a way I encourage people to make it as a mini Advent retreat. So, you know, take some time to really dive in, learn more through resources. Like like some of the stuff I talked about today are all covered in that course and a whole lot more. And the whole course is only like $20. So it's something you to do with your family. And you can also practice, you know, some of those uh, divine office prayers in it too. And and so much more as a family. So make sure you're living the liturgical life and, and learning too. So I would encourage anybody who wants to learn more to check that out. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And God bless. Bye.